Hello to all our friends at the Grace Baptist Church. Sorry we couldn't be there today with this COVID business. It's such a pain, isn't it? But anyway, we're, we're glad to be able to share with you uh, in this way. And uh, our passage uh, this morning, and the, the message is about the easy yoke from uh, Matthew 11. And my wife, Marg, is going to read that passage to you now. Hi. I'm reading today from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When I was a teenager, my parents uh, were in India, and I was there with them, uh, teaching in a school. And uh, when we were there, it amazed me, we'd be driving along the road and there'd be these oxen pulling a huge load uh, on a cart behind them. Sometimes it was piled really high with, with something like straw and sometimes the person would be up the top asleep and the, the oxen would just keep on walking along the road. Uh, but other times they were loaded up with uh, huge big tree trunks uh, and piled high on the cart and then the, these two poor oxen were trying to pull this heavy load along and just making their way. I imagine when they stopped and then had to start again it would be pretty hard for them to get going because it was so heavy. And Jesus today in our passage talks about this kind of load that people are bearing. He saw the people of his day and many people today are the same who are yoked and burdened with a very heavy load of the law and rules that they live by. Uh, the people of the day in Matthew chapter 23 we read that the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus said, tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. Well, that's what a yoke is, laying it on people's shoulders shoulders and so Jesus spoke again of the yoke there describing the law and how it was a burden to the people and it says come to me Jesus says uh, all you who are weary and burdened weary the word actually in the Greek means to be tired from hard labor hard toil even to working to the point of exhaustion and then the word burdened is uh, to be loaded down with a very heavy load. And uh, they were weary for keep, of keeping the law in order to please God, and not just the law of the Old Testament uh, Torah, but also the law uh, that was the oral law, the Mishnah and the Talmud that the Jewish people had added to the law to try and interpret the law in terms of uh, how to apply it in all different situations. And the Apostle uh, Peter, when he talked to uh, the Jewish leaders at, at the time of Acts chapter 15, uh, sorry, to the church leaders, he said to them about the law being the man-made yoke uh, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. So it was very real for them at that time. And we find that in, uh, in Israel, my wife and I went to Israel some years ago, and uh, when we stayed at the hotel there on, on the Sabbath, we, uh, we, had, uh, we couldn't go up in the lift without and press a button. You had to get in the lift and it would stop at every floor. So you didn't have to work to press a button so you'd go to your floor. 
Um, and this was part of applying the rule, the laws, uh, to the people of the time. And uh, they had one kitchen for breakfast and another kitchen and dining room for the other meals. And at breakfast you could have uh, dairy products, but you couldn't mix them with meat because the law says you can't. And then, and then the other uh, kitchen was for meat products uh, that they would produce, uh, I mean uh, food that they would produce in that kitchen and in that dining room. Even the plates and silverware, everything was separate in case a little bit of uh, meat could somehow mixed with a little bit of dairy. So these were the law, there were laws that burdened the people down. And Jesus applying to this situation uh, what, what, what he had brought with him to set the people free, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Notice, first of all, he gives an invitation here. He gives the invitation, come to me, he says. Come to me. Don't come to a church or a religion. Don't come to a pastor or a priest. Don't come to rites and rituals that are religious. Come to me. Jesus is the liberator. Jesus is the one that will set them and us free. And don't come uh, either with a sense that you have to become a better person and experience certain things in order to uh, uh, get God's approval. And uh, he says, no, you come to me. It's interesting that in the context of him saying that, uh, in the early part of this chapter, we read these words that the, uh, the apostles, the, um, sorry, the um, disciples of John the Baptist said to Jesus, are you the one who is to come or do we expect someone else? And Jesus responded to that and in different ways. But at this end of the chapter, he says, I am the one, basically. Uh, come to me uh, requires us to look at who he is and have faith in him. If we're going to come to him to be set free from our sin and from our uh, burden of trying to keep the law and appease God's wrath by doing ourselves uh, what we cannot do. So Jesus in the verses just prior to the invitation here that we had read to us, he, he says these things that he declares that he is equal with God. Uh, he says the Son fully represents the Father. All things have been handed to me by my father he says uh, that's an amazing claim if he wasn't the son of god he couldn't say that um, and neither could he say what he goes on to say that only the father fully understands the son and only the son fully understands the father and jesus um, both being god and man he alone can reveal god to us wow i remember what uh was it uh, Thomas said, I think it was Thomas, anyway, in John chapter 14, uh, show us the Father. And Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So when we come to Jesus, we come to who he is and also, of course, what he did. That he, being the Saviour, came into the world to die on the cross, to deal with the problem of sin that... Uh, separates us from God so that we don't have to try and appease God or please God by what we do, keeping the law and rules that have been made, but simply trusting in him who set us free through his death on the cross of Calvary. So come to me is also an imperative. It is actually a command. So Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then after the invitation, he then gives an explanation. What does he mean, come to me and I will give you rest? He goes on to say, take my yoke upon you, my yoke, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. This is a new principle to live by. 
an explanation of how we can find rest and how we can have that burden lifted is to come to Him and take His yoke. Not the yoke of the law or of man-made rules, but the yoke of Christ, of obedience to Christ. He says, take my yoke. Come to me, take my yoke, learn from me, and I will give you rest. So again, he's emphasizing that he is the one who gives this freedom. And, and uh, the new principle to live by is him living under the lordship of Christ. Which of course is obeying the law because he is God in flesh. And when you obey Christ, you obey God. And when you obey God, you're keeping the law. But not a whole written code. But the transformation which uh, is going to be brought into the world by Christ and, and has, now we look back, uh, happened at Pentecost and then from there on. But Jesus was anticipating that in what he said. So the inner transformation of new birth and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit is what will change from the burden of the law to the yoke of obedience to Christ that is light and is not burdensome. In 1 John chapter 5 verses 2 to 4 we read, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. So being born of God, being born again, receiving eternal life, new life, His life, and the transformation, the renewal uh, that happens at that time by the, uh, it says the uh, renewal of the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter when he talks about new birth. And so he's, this is what happens when we're born again. The power of His Spirit and the freedom that, the, that He brings uh, gives us victory over the desires of the flesh. So how do we do this? How do we actually live in the light of this, this new principle to live by where the yoke is easy and the burden is light? His yoke is, first of all, he says, learn from me. Now, the word learn is, is a allied to it. It's, it's actually in the Greek very close to and they're, they're basically from the same root. And that is disciple. So be my disciple. Learn from me. And as a disciple, the disciples of John the Baptist had spoken to him. The Pharisees uh, had their own disciples. Rabbis had their disciples. And Jesus said, you need to learn from me. Um, and so we learn a few things about this learning. First of all, it is practical. He said, learn from me. I am meek and lowly or gentle and humble is another way to translate that. He says, your learning from me will be transformational in that it will affect your day-to-day -day living in your relationships with one another. You'll be meek and lowly. That's something that you can't prescribe in a written code or law. It is something that is from the heart. So your relationships will change. Your workplace, even in the church, uh, to be meek and lowly is learning from Christ and the, the yoke of bowing to the Lordship of Christ and following Him will result in that kind of change in a person's life. It is dynamic. It is real. As Jesus said to His disciples in John 13, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. If if there's been that transformation where you are meek and lowly, which is basically uh, a prerequisite for loving others. <clears throat> there was a man who asked a professor about a young man he knew. Uh, how's he getting on? Uh, he says, I understand he's one of your students. And the professor replied to him, well, we, um, he may have attended my lectures, but he's not one of my students. And you know, you can attend lectures as it were, you can attend church, you can be involved in the Christian community. But are you a genuine follower of Christ? Are you learning from Him? Is that Spirit of God indwelling you? Have you really been born again? Have you trusted Christ and invited Him to come into your life 
with the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Is that a reality for you? If not, I encourage you to look again and turn to Christ in genuine faith and commitment. So not only is learning practical, when Jesus said learn of me, he's also showing that it's spiritual because his, he says that you, um, uh, you will, uh, sorry, I've lost my place. Uh, I am meek and lowly uh, of heart, in heart. In other words, it's a spiritual thing. It, it's something that's internal and not just imposed externally on you. As it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we're to be transformed by the renewal of our minds that we may live a life that's pleasing to God, basically, it goes on to say. Uh, this um, does not say, learn from me the doctrines and the truths of the Christian faith, but it's saying, learn from me a transformational way of living to be a lowly and humble, meek in heart. For he said, I am lowly in heart. In other words, I serve. That's what Jesus did. He, he gave the example of the kind of life that he's now calling us to learn from him. And by putting the yoke of obedience to him on, we actually, from the heart, follow him. So he says, uh, I am lowly of heart, learn from me. In Mark 10, 45, we read, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And we know the passage in Philippians where it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very, by the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking what? The very nature of a servant, lowly of heart. And John 13, when he washed the disciples' feet, and he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, your rabbi, your master, your Lord, me, he says, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. Learn from me. I am meek and lowly. You be meek and lowly of heart. And thirdly, which we've alluded to already, but learning is following. The yoke is a metaphor for submission. The oxen submit to the master who pulls them or shows them the direction to go. And uh, so it is with us. We put on the yoke of obedience to Christ. To be a true disciple, the evidence of that is obedience. In 1 John, that comes out very clearly in the whole letter that John wrote at that time. But also in John 8 verse 31, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Um, back at that time of Christ, when there was a student sitting under a rabbi, um, it was often spoken that they were under the yoke of the teacher. Uh, an ancient Jewish writing contains the advice, put your neck under the yoke and receive instruction. So it, it is something that the disciples that Jesus was speaking to at that time understood to take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Uh, in Jeremiah 5 verse 5, Israel is spoken of as having broken the yoke. They were disobedient in the context. They refused to obey God's law and so they broke the yoke. And so yoke to Christ is obedience, walking with him. But it's not lawlessness. When we uh, disregard the yoke of the law and come under the yoke of Christ, uh, it doesn't mean that we are lawless. It means that uh, we replace law keeping with his lordship, that we follow God, the son, 
and God the Father by means of God the Holy Spirit and uh, it's not alien to the law it's just the fulfillment of the law as the Spirit of God works in us so that kind of obedience obedience to the Lordship of Christ rather than to an outward set of rules that is easy in comparison he says he goes on to say my yoke is easy and my burden is light how is that so um, my yoke is easy that's translated from a passage from the words in the Greek that really means to fit perfectly and of course back then they didn't have machines to hollow out and make uh, yokes that fitted over animals properly they had carpenters and guess what Jesus was a carpenter um, and so the hand carved yoke fits the next neck perfectly for every single disciple uh, the Lord has a hand crafted perfectly fitting yoke for you isn't that beautiful isn't that wonderful he says basically my my yoke fits well uh, and uh, compared to religion my yoke is easy and my burden uh, that I have of obedience to him is light again in 1st John chapter 5 verses 2 to 4 we read we love God and obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome they're not burdensome he describes the new dynamic we've talked about that is the inner core hearts of the disciples are, are transformed by the Spirit and are able to be gentle and lowly if we walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh it's our choice but it's there he's there and we are able to uh, live the way God wants us and intended us to live the inner life and empowerment is the inner dwelling of the Holy Spirit and we read in Romans chapter 7 verse 6 we have been released from the law so that we can serve in the new way of the Spirit exactly that uh, and then in Galatians 5 verse 18 but if you are led by the Spirit you are not under the law to be led by the Spirit to be prompted by the Spirit when you face a situation should I or shouldn't I do that I don't have a problem with that even though some people have rules about it uh, and the Spirit of God hasn't shown me there's nothing in Scripture to say I should or shouldn't but I, I don't have a problem with that at all um, but there's another thing that I'm really concerned about uh, is prompting of the Spirit again there's nothing in the Bible that says you can or cannot do that but um, I just sense the Spirit of God is not happy not pleased if I do that or don't do that and so we are led by the Spirit or meant to be in our Christian lives the only alternative uh, to that kind of living is to live under the law or live under man-made rules and Paul warned Christians of legalism because that's what it's called legalism although we are saved by grace many believe our performance causes us to earn God's favor or, or forfeit God's favor and God's blessing so what is legalism legalism is the mindset that God's approval and blessing is dependent on us keeping rules laws God's law sure but also lots of rules that men and women make up uh, and so Galatians 3 1 Paul says you foolish Galatians he goes on to say how foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the spirit why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort so there's two kinds of rules that's God's law and our own rules or people's rules that they make up so a form of legalism is uh, those who live by a list of do's and don'ts in order to gain God's favor and blessing now there's always do's and don'ts uh, we set them for ourselves now I won't watch a movie that has that kind of uh, portrayal in it uh, or it's, uh, overtly uh, violent or whatever it is we, we set our own rules and there's nothing wrong with that but legalism is when you then expect it and impose it on others 
And so a church can be legalistic by imposing certain rules on, on all the people. They should only wear certain hair or only have certain hats and all sorts of things. I was brought up in a church like that. Uh, and, and so um, there's a breaking away from that, rightly so, because that's legalism. Uh, to impose your rules or others' rules on other people and then you sit in judgment on them when they don't live up to your rules and they feel guilty uh, for failing to live up to what the rules have been set for them. I remember as a kid uh, we went with my parents, um, this is when we left that very legalistic church and we went down to uh, Gippsland and stayed with some friends who actually were still in that very legalistic kind of church and um, I went out as I often did on a a Sunday afternoon and I got a cricket bat and ball and started um, playing around and uh, I was really told off uh, you don't do that on Sunday all right well um, we all have different views on what we should or shouldn't can and can't do on a Sunday uh, it's not the Sabbath it's the first day of the week and we're not under the law of the Sabbath but we still recognize that we need to set aside a day to worship the Lord so um, but we have different views on that, and so to be legalistic is not just to have rules for yourself, but to expect it of and impose it on others. So legalism, a few things about legalism just quickly before we move on. Legalism is powerless because the sinful nature isn't dealt with, it's still there. And so it says in Colossians 2.23, these regulations, and you're talking there about keeping the Sabbath and all sorts of things, these lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence or as the New Living Translation has it. These rules have no effect when it comes to conquering a person's evil thoughts and desires. Secondly, legalism is deceptive. A person can be inwardly self-centered, proud, willful, and yet live by a certain set of external rules. So it doesn't deal with the inner self. It's deceptive for that reason. And next, it's, it's a form of slavery. Galatians 5.1 Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't, what? Get tied up again in slavery to the law. Next, legalism feeds pride. I knew a, a person in Tennessee, I, sp I did a summer, American summer over there in a, a training uh, course and uh, this person uh, shared that um, they were convicted about the way that TV had become an obsession for his family and so he and they gave it up for a whole year and he said now in retrospect as he looked back and spoke to us he said he, that during that time he found himself feeling quite proud and spiritually superior when he heard of others who were watching those programs that they'd stopped watching. It's so easy to fuel your pride when you live by rules. And lastly, as I already mentioned earlier, but it's judgmental. And Galatians, I'm oh, sorry, Colossians 2 verse 16 says, therefore, do not let anyone judge you about what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. And finally, he promises a confirmation, a confirmation to find rest. He says, you will find rest for your souls. You like that? Rest for your souls. He says, take my yoke on you and you will find rest. That doesn't seem to go together. But the yoke of obedience to him is not heavy and burdensome. So you'll find rest for your souls. There's two times uh, Jesus uses the word rest in this passage. First of all, he talks about the rest of salvation. Come to me, all you who are burdened down, I will give you rest. Then he says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, and goes on to say, and you will find rest for your souls. So there's the rest of salvation, but secondly, there's the rest of submission, the rest of transformation. Uh, you may have rest, you 
may have the rest of salvation, but still be restless, still have a burden of trying to obey the outward law. So Christ calls us to not be weighed down, but to be transformed by the renewal of our minds that we may please him in the way we live. You see, we take the yoke of Christ and the burden of obeying the law, but it's not a burden. It's like wings on a bird. They weigh a bit. Sometimes the big birds that weighs quite a bit, imagine. But the wings become the means of flight and they're able to soar because of the burden of their wings, the weight of their wings, but their wings are there to lift them up. Uh, Oswald Chambers says, it seems amazingly difficult to put on the yoke of Christ, but immediately we have put it on, everything becomes easy. I like that. I'm going to read it again. He says, it seems amazingly difficult to put on the yoke of Christ. Total obedience, total submission, and following the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He says, but immediately we do that, put it on, everything becomes easy. I want to finish with a story which I read some years ago. I'm not sure the details, but I do know this is what the story is. That a father had a high expectation for his son to become a lawyer or a, uh, an accountant or someone like that. Send him to university to get his degree. But this boy, he loved music. That was his passion and his love. And um, all the nights he was up there studying, trying to get his degree, was a huge burden to him. He wasn't mathematically minded, in fact, and, and science and everything, it was just it was not easy for him at all. And finally he gave it up and he went into music. He loved the violin. And he managed to get into an orchestra and um, he had to practice his violin hours every day to get it just right so he would he would just play perfectly in the orchestra. And all those hours of practice and practice and practice, it was easy for him. All the hours of study was a burden, but music was his passion. He loved it, and so he enjoyed it. He worked just as hard, but he loved it. It was him. And so we are called to love God and to obey him. And when we do take the yoke of Christ, he sets us free to be who we were created to be, whom the Spirit of God has transformed us and is transforming us to be, like him. God bless you all.